And so we're going to get into this today. Like Mark set us up, uh, he, he was letting you know that we're on week three of our series called The Reason. We've been looking at Jesus as our healer. You know, before we do anything else, before we get into our, our, our message today, I've got three points that I want to share with you today. Before we get into that, I just want to say, you know, we are praying for you every day. We pray for our church family every day, but in particular this week, it's been on our heart to pray for those who are sick. And so what a perfect time to be praying or to be preaching about Jesus as our healer. But we want to just look right down the camera and say, if you're out there and you are feeling sick today, or you have someone in your family who is sick, if you've been personally impacted by coronavirus in any way, if you're a medical professional, we are praying for you. Uh, you medical professionals, you're our heroes right now. And so thank you for what you are doing. We love you. We, we are with you. And it is true that there is no distance in the spirit. So all together, why don't we get into the word today. So uh, Pastor Mark set us up with Isaiah chapter 53. And really that is, uh, it's kind of the, the anchor point of our entire message today. But I want to kind of bounce off of Isaiah 53 and look at three reasons why we call Jesus our healer. And the first one you already heard in that Isaiah 53 passage, it's that famous line. If you've been around church for a while, you've probably heard somebody pray this phrase that you are are healed or we are healed by the stripes of Jesus. And those stripes, what it's talking about, some translations say wounds. Uh, we are healed by the wounds that Jesus took on. He willingly took on pain for us so that we could experience life and healing. Now that's an Old Testament idea and it was a prophecy that Isaiah wrote over 700 years before Jesus actually took on those stripes and took on those wounds and paid the price so that we could experience healing. Can you imagine that? That God was telling the church, he was telling his people, 700 years before it was happening, I'm going to set you free. This is incredible. I mean, just right there, that should give us some hope that God does actually have a plan for the future. Amen, as we're coming down the tail end of a year like this one. And so as we look at Isaiah 53, then we move into the New Testament and we see that again, this same idea is echoed. In fact, a guy named Peter, who was one of Jesus' disciples, he actually quotes Isaiah all these hundreds and hundreds of years later. And so if you looked at 1 Peter chapter 2 with me today, and I'll, I'll read some of these verses for you. Uh, and it says in the, in the CSB translation, uh, as, as Peter is talking to some of his friends, you remember a couple of weeks ago we had wrapped up this series in the book of James, and James was writing to his friends who were Christians who were scattered abroad. It said that they were kind of living all over the place in the region. Well, Peter's writing to many of those same Christians, and he's writing specifically about how to look at Jesus in this moment, in 1 Peter chapter 2, about how to look at Jesus as a model when we we feel like we are suffering, we can look at him and see how he behaved during suffering, and we can find some examples and some hope. And so in the middle of that context, then we pick it up in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, and it says, for you, remember this is Peter talking to Christians, so this can apply to you as well. He says, for you were called to this, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. He did not commit sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. I mean, like, this isn't the topic of my sermon today. We're talking about healing but that's just really good advice for how to work function in the world. He goes on, he says, when Jesus suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. <clears throat> he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about Jesus as our savior. This is a mention of the atonement that he paid the price by bearing our sins on the cross for us, right? He bore our sins in his body on the tree so that, having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. Now, righteousness. Now, all of that is really good news, but here's where Peter pulls in Isaiah. He says, by his wounds, you have been healed. And verse 25 wraps up this thought where he says, for you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. <clears throat> 
Now, just for context, I want you to notice here that Peter is quoting Isaiah 53, this famous, by his stripes you are healed passage, and he's not actually talking about physical sickness in this moment. This is really interesting as we take our first look at a New Testament reference of this promise, by the stripes of Jesus you are healed, that it's couched in a context talking about how to live holistically healed in a unhealed world, in a broken world, how to live a life of peace, how to follow Jesus as our example. Peter's actually implying here that there is more to healing, to having the stripes of Jesus heal us. There's more to that than just our physical bodies. Pause for a second. Peter's not saying, and I'm not saying, and the Bible doesn't teach us, that God is not interested in healing our physical bodies. We'll get to that in the next point. But this very first point, as we wrestle with what, is, what the meaning of Jesus healing us by his stripes are, is we see that Peter is couching this in the context of our entire lives and the way we live in the world and ultimately the way we relate to God. You see, the very first thing that we need to wrestle with healing about is our relationship with God. That's why Peter ends this passage by saying, for you were like sheep who had gone astray, but you have returned. That returned is an idea of your relationship with God was healed. You had returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. And so Peter wants us to catch this idea. Certainly there is physical healing available for the believer, and we'll talk about that. But To say we are healed by the stripes of Jesus, which is our first point today, is to say that there is healing for our relational brokenness. This is the healing that is the the healing of our soul when our souls are broken and split by sin and we make confession and we restore our relationship with God. Our, Our souls become healed. We return to God. And there's emotional healing for the places where our spirits are broken. And maybe that's a great description of how some of you are feeling in 2020. I have to be honest, I, this morning before starting our live stream, my spirit felt a little bit like it needed some healing. I grabbed my guitar and I just started playing a song that I play to remind myself that God is for me no matter what feels like it's against me. And you know what? In that moment, I found Jesus meeting me and reminding me that by his stripes, he can heal me in my emotional broken state. This is so good to say that his stripes paid the price for me to experience complete healing. Amen? By the way, type amen in the comments if you're hearing some good stuff. I'm used to having people in front of me again. And so go ahead and type amen if you're hearing something good. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I'm going to have Pastor Mark come over here and, and open this water bottle for me. Um, look at that. I opened it. Um, <laughs> That water bottle is going to need some healing. What you didn't see off camera is I threw it, and it hit something, and it just exploded. So um, I really wish that you could have seen that moment in slow-mo. It would have been glorious. Uh, But anyway, now I feel like I don't even need water. (laughs) But he's going to bring it to me anyway because he's such a good friend. All right, let's continue. So we are healed by the stripes of Jesus. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Our second point today is that we are healed by the will of Jesus. <laughs> We're healed by the will of Jesus. Uh, can you just type in the comments that, just type this phrase, God wants to do it. Just type that phrase, God wants to do it. That's what it means to say we are healed by the will of Jesus. Now, we were in the book of 1 Peter. If you flip over to the gospel of Matthew, Matthew is the first of the New Testament books. It's the first New Testament gospel, and it's written primarily to Jewish Christians, people of Jewish descent who believe in Jesus. And these people were hearing from Matthew all of the reasons why Jesus was the Messiah. And so it's really interesting the way that he begins to tell the story of the ministry of Jesus. Now, I'm going to read to you a few stories. In fact, there's three separate stories that I want to share with you, and they're all listed back to back to back. In Matthew chapter 8, starting in verse 1, here is how Matthew tells some of the stories of Jesus's ministry. Oh, and one other thing I want you to pay attention to. Pay attention to the way Jesus engages in these moments. 
as we're thinking about we are healed by the will of Jesus, and then pay attention to the way Matthew wraps up these set of stories. So first story, number one, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 1, when he, that's Jesus, came down from the mountain, he was having a moment away with the Father. Uh, when he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. That was par for the course. It says, right away, a man with leprosy came up and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Reaching out his hand, which was a big no-no for somebody with leprosy. You just don't want to touch those people uh, because it was, it, it, it could, you could have gotten leprosy. It would have been bad for you, but Jesus, watch what he does. Reaching out his hand, Jesus touched him, saying, I am willing, be made clean. And then listen to this. It says, immediately his leprosy was cleansed. That's story number one. Story number two starts in verse five, still Matthew chapter eight, verse five. It says, when he entered Capernaum, now he's moving throughout a day. When he entered Capernaum, a centurion, which is a, a Roman soldier of high authority, a centurion came to him pleading with him. Already an interesting context that a Roman centurion of high authority who could have told Jesus what he wanted him to do and Jesus kind of would have had to go along with it. Uh, he, he was kind of like the law enforcement official of the day. He comes rolling up and he's pleading with Jesus. And here's what he says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 6. Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed in terrible agony. Jesus says to him, am I to come and heal him? He's asking him, are you telling me to go with you to heal your servant right now? In other contexts, uh, he says, oh, I'll go with you. He's demonstrating a willingness to submit to the moment that the centurion is coming and saying, hey, I have this servant at home. He's sick. And Jesus goes, I'll go with you if that's what you're asking me to do. In verse 8, it says, the centurion replies, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof. But just say the word and my servant will be healed. I mean, that's incredible. He says, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under my command. I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to another one, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. Hearing this, Jesus was amazed. I mean, you've got to feel pretty good about yourself if you're this Roman centurion now, looking back on the story, that you've amazed Jesus, right? So Jesus was amazed, and he says to everyone who's following him, everyone standing around watching this conversation happen, he says, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with so great a faith. And then in verse 13, Jesus looks at the centurion and he says, go, as you have believed, let it be done for you. And then when he gets home, he finds out that his servant was healed at that very moment. That's incredible. That's story number Two. Story number three begins in the very next verse, in verse 14, still in Matthew chapter 8. Jesus goes into Peter's house, and he saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. So he touched her hand, and the fever left her. Then she got up and began to serve him. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. He drove out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. He healed all who were sick in that moment so that and he did this so that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled remember the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53 over 700 years ago wrote these words and here's how Matthew ends this moment he himself took our weaknesses and carried our diseases quick recap of three stories remember what I wanted you to pay attention to was the way Jesus engaged in these moments and Notice the way Matthew ended these set of stories. Story number one, Jesus is asked if he's willing to heal. A very straightforward response. He says, I'm willing, and immediately healing happens. Story number two, Jesus is approached by a Roman centurion. Notice again, the centurion absolutely could have said, you're coming with me right now to my house. I've got a job for you to do. I hear you're a miracle worker. But instead, he came pleading and asking Jesus to do a miracle on behalf of this servant that he clearly cared a great deal for. And Jesus saw his faith and saw that he wasn't being forced in that moment. And I've got to think that the way that the centurion approached Jesus with a request, not a demand, had something to do with the way that Jesus talked about the centurion saying, this person has great faith because he comes humble and he comes believing. He comes trusting. That is incredible. But again, we see that Jesus willingly extended healing towards a person. And by the way, side note, how powerful is Jesus that he doesn't even have to go to the guy's house to physically heal him? 
That's amazing. Proving that you don't actually need physical contact to get healing. It's one of the ways healing happens. But Jesus' word for healing is powerful enough. Amen. Story number three, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law and also a whole crowd of people. I know that you could argue that this maybe was like two separate stories and it's technically four stories and not three, but let's lump all of these together. Here's what happens. Jesus walks into a house. He's not even asked if he would heal. He just does it because sometimes Jesus is just moved with compassion and he just does a work for us out of the kindness and the goodness of his heart and his love for us. He just heals her. And then after all all of this stuff that he's done today, I, I don't know if it's tiring for Jesus physically to do healings. I, I really actually don't know because at one point when the woman with the flow of blood touches the hem of the garment, it says he felt power going out of him. We have no idea if there was a, a sense of Jesus needing to, to rest after this long day of ministry. We really just have no context about that. But what we do know is that there's been this long day. And we know Jesus walked a lot and he engaged with a lot of people. And at the end of the day, a giant crowd of people shows up. There's some demon-possessed folks in that crowd, which means it was a rowdy crowd. And some sick people showed up. And Jesus, it says, he cast out the demons with one word, with a word, just, hey, get out of here, or go, or be free. Whatever that word was that he spoke, they were free in that moment. And then he healed all of the sick people. What we see in all of these stories is Jesus absolutely willing to heal. When we say that we, Jesus heals us by his will, it means that Jesus extends his desire to heal us for every single person. Jesus wants to heal. And finally, again, did you notice, did you catch the way Matthew ends these stories? Jesus, it says in verse 17, Jesus healed these people so that what the prophet spoke through Isaiah what might be fulfilled. He himself took our weaknesses and carried away our diseases. So the reason that we call Jesus our healer, as we tie all of this New Testament prophecies or the Old Testament prophecies and the New Testament realities of the story of Matthew and, and first Peter looking back on the ministry of Jesus and saying what he does, we, we tie all of that together. We say that we, Jesus is our healer because he paid the price for our healing by taking on pain so that we could be set free from pain. And he absolutely desires to do it. Amen. Now, we can never force Jesus to do anything. We should definitely learn the lesson from the centurion. We can't force Jesus' hand. But we don't have to because we have a God who wants to do it for us. And we should praise God for that very thing. Now, the third point that I have for you today, remember that Jesus, we are healed by his stripes and we are healed by his will. And the third point is that we are healed by the name of Jesus. Now, in the New Testament church, as it was just getting started in the book of Acts, uh, some people actually refer to this as the fifth gospel because you begin to see Jesus uh, doing ministry through the church, the Holy Spirit coming and doing ministry through the early church. Uh, and, and you actually begin to see in chapter 3, right after Pentecost Sunday, the Holy Spirit has come in fire and power and all these thousands of people have been saved and people are being added to the church every day. We see another story of a guy named Peter, who we've heard about before, one of his disciples, and a friend of his named John, who was also one of Jesus' disciples. Now, they're going into the temple. It's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon at this moment, and it says in Acts chapter 3, we see this story about how we, where we learn that we are healed by the name of Jesus. So Peter and John are going up to, for the time of prayer about 3 in the afternoon. Acts chapter 3, verse 2, a man who was lame from birth was being carried there. He was placed each day at the temple gate called Beautiful so that he could beg from those entering the temple. Now, he had no other means of making any money or income, and so he was placed there probably by someone in his family so that he could ask for some money, and then that was a way for him to provide for his own resources. Otherwise, there would, he probably would have starved to death. And so he would sit there every day, and as people would come in, that there was a Jewish custom that he would ask, and then there was kind of this custom that he would probably very regularly get enough to uh, provide for his food for that day. And then verse 3, it says, When Peter and John uh, were about to enter the temple, he asked them for money. 
Now, again, the custom is he, they would actually give the, him some money. But in verse 4, it says, Peter, along with John, looked straight at him and said, look at us. Now, he's saying, I want to have a conversation with you. I'm not going to just practice this ritual where we give you some money and walk on or where we ignore you and pretend that you're not there or whatever it was. He says, look at us. We're about to have a moment with you. And in verse 5, it says, so he turned to them expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you. Now, he's saying, I've got something. I don't have what you've asked me for, but you and I both know he's actually got something that's better than that, right? And he's about to tell him, I do have something that is very meaningful for you. And, it, and it, we're actually going to find out that it's even a greater resource than the one he had asked for. So he says, I don't have money, but I give you what I have. And then he says this, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. That is a powerful sentence. But he didn't say, I heal you right now. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ. He said, I don't have money, but I will give you the name of Jesus. And watch the results. He says, get up and walk. Then taking him by the right hand, he raised him up. And at once, his feet and ankles became strong. So he jumped up and he started to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. All of the other people around them, by the way, they were like, hey, isn't that the guy who sits out begging for money outside the gate, beautiful every day? Yeah, it is that guy. What's he doing walking around and leaping and dancing? I didn't even know. Like, was he faking it? No, he totally wasn't faking it. He actually was paralyzed this whole life. What happened to him? And he's praising God and he tells them what happened is I was healed. And it, the story goes on. It's this incredible moment. But the point of all of that is that Peter gave him the name of Jesus as the thing, as the catalyst, as the, the enacting agent of this healing. Now, in Jewish culture, they understand something that we don't understand as much in our American culture, which is that names actually have power. That names actually carry authority. So when Jesus was getting ready to create or launch the New Testament church before the ascension into heaven, he actually made it a point to make sure he gave them the, the, the church and he gave them his name. And he said, give me and give what I've given you away to other people. So the paralyzed man and Peter and John all would have understood that what was happening was he was saying, I can't give you this tangible money thing, but I can give you something of a sense of authority to meet another need. And so rather than meeting your belly need for a moment by giving you some money so you can eat, let me give you a name which has power to meet your ultimate need physically speaking, which is that you can't walk. Now he can go get a job. He can go work at Starbucks and actually earn a living for himself because he can walk. And we'll get into on another day the cultural challenges of why he had to do that and why he couldn't work when he couldn't walk. But that was the culture he was living in at the time. And Peter knew the most important thing I can give you is the name of Jesus. Now, let me be very clear. If I haven't been clear enough, I've tried to repeat this point in a few different ways already to be as clear as possible, but let me just come right out and say it. Peter did not heal this man. Peter did not do it. Jesus healed him. That's why Peter didn't just pick him up by the hand and say, hey, be healed. He said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. He's automatically giving credit to Jesus because he knows he can't do it without Jesus. It's not him doing the miracle. He's ministering the miracle. It's Jesus doing the healing. So we don't heal people. Jesus does that. How does he do it? By his stripes. He heals people by his will, and he heals people by his name. Now, as I'm preaching this message today, I am absolutely aware that there are all kinds of reasons on the other side of that camera that need healing. There's all kinds of broken places in our lives <clears throat> that need healing. Some of them are physical. Maybe you are facing a challenge of sickness today. Maybe this has been a long-term battle that you have been facing. Uh, maybe it's some kind of disease that you are asking God to remove from your life. Maybe you're sick temporarily right now. Maybe you have coronavirus. Maybe you have a flu. Maybe you have some other physical ailment. 
And can I tell you that the Jesus who healed a paralyzed man all those hundreds of years ago is still alive today, and his name still carries authority to heal our physical bodies. But let's not forget that there are probably also people sitting on the other side of that camera who have emotional pain and brokenness, relational brokenness. You might be watching this right now and you don't actually even have a relationship with God, but for some reason and somehow you jumped onto this video and you're watching this and you're listening to some random guy talk about this man named Jesus and something inside of you is realizing you are broken inside. You don't have a relationship with a God who heals. Jesus loves you. And it's his love and his will and his name that caused him. It's all of his love and his passion for you that caused him, that led him to the cross to die for you. And he, it was his power and his authority over death and brokenness that, that allowed him and gave him the ability to raise from the dead. And he's now seated at the right hand of the Father, loving you. And if you're broken today in any physical place, in any place in your spirit or your soul, Jesus still heals. And so I think it would be appropriate if we end a sermon like this with prayer. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to pray for you. And if you are on the other side over there sitting wherever you are, we believe that there is no distance in the spirit. And so wherever you are right now and whatever you are going through right now, I believe that as I pray, Jesus and his Holy Spirit can meet you in your place and minister healing to you. And so let's pray. And, and by the way, if you're, if you're in a great place and you're thinking, I, I don't think I need healing right now, pray with me for our friends and join with me in agreeing that Jesus can do a work for others. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you are so amazing to tie these realities that you want us to learn about your power to heal and your desire to heal, that you wove all of that through Holy Scripture. We thank you that we can see it as a promise in the Old Testament, and we can still see it as a promise in the New Testament. We thank you that when you gave us your name at the, for the first members of the New Testament church, that we still carry your name. And so, Jesus, I ask that you, in your name and in your love and by your will and by your stripes, that you would minister healing to those watching today. For any person who is in, in need of, of a relational healing with you, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would move on their life and on their heart right now. If you're watching this and you don't have a relationship with Jesus I can tell you in a thousand different ways that he is the only way for you to have hope and to have life and to find forgiveness of your sins and to find true healing. And so if that's you today, would you just simply say, Jesus, I put my faith in you. I ask that you would heal my relationship with God. And I believe that as you pray that prayer that something is beginning to happen in your life. Jesus, thank you that you administer that healing of relationship to those. We also know that there might be people on the other side of this camera who have emotional pain, some kind of spiritual brokenness, mental brokenness, or, or, or brokenness in their, in their heart. Jesus, would you, bring, would you bring peace and would you bring hope and would you bring healing? And we know that there are people watching this who need physical healing as well. Jesus, we thank you that you heal. You have always been a healing God and that you still are today. We thank you that your healing power and authority in your name carries into 2020 and it will carry into the future and it will carry over the internet to the people watching this right now. If you're watching this and you need physical healing, I pray for you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, be healed. Thank you, Jesus, that you would begin to minister healing work today. Thank you, Jesus, that you would heal our hearts, 
our minds, our relationship with you, that you would show us how to walk in healed relationships with others, that you would heal our physical brokenness as well. God, you are so very good. In fact, right where you're sitting right now, can you just begin to say thank you to Jesus for his, his word and, and for his faithfulness and for his love for us that would cause him to tell us, I still want you to be healed. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. We are grateful for you. In Jesus' name, amen.